so, hi, my name is Ryan J. Salva. I am a product manager on uh, the Visual Studio team. I'm also a JavaScript developer of about 15 years and a committer to the Apache Cordova project. Today, I'm going to take the next 30 minutes or so to talk to you a little bit about performance. And a lot of the lessons that I talk about today will apply to Cordova, but they apply equally well to the mobile web. Uh, and so really, this is just going to be a, a tour of a bunch of science that we conducted. And I mean that, like science with a capital S, really important science, to better understand how exactly Perf works for mobile applications when they're using web technologies. Sound like a good time? Yeah? Sounds like a good time? Awesome. All right, sweet. So, hey, if uh, along this you learn anything that uh, you didn't know before, use the hashtag perfmatters on Twitter and um, share it with your friends because science is everyone's um, awesome thing to learn. All right, so like I said before, the lessons we learned today are going to apply equally well between hybrid applications and mobile web. And just to kind of level set, I want to make sure that everyone understands when I talk about hybrid applications, what I'm really talking about here. So this is the primary technology is Cordova. Most people know what Cordova is or PhoneGap. Yeah? Yeah? Yar? OK, good. Excellent. So the basic idea behind it is that Cordova, at its core, is a web application that sits inside of a web view inside of a native application. And as a web application, all of the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript are packaged locally. Uh, but they kind of talk back to native APIs, whether it be the camera API or the address book or the accelerometer, through these asynchronous calls that bridge the web view and talk back to native code. The, Brilliant thing about this is that it kind of gives you like a, a browser on steroids. You get access to all these native APIs that you wouldn't have access to otherwise, and you get support for offline by virtue of the fact that all of that HTML, CSS, and JavaScript have been packaged locally. So that's the basic architecture, and um, we're going to kind of use that to explore, like, there's this perception, there's this general kind of ickiness, this feeling that web applications and hybrid applications, when compared to native applications, don't quite stand up. They don't really um, cut the butter, as it were. And so in the next 30 minutes, we're going to try and dispel some of those myths using science. All right. To understand performance, you first need to understand what it actually means to be fast and responsive. So here's what I want you guys to do. Here's how I want you to think about it. I got a nice little graph here, and there's lots of different flavors and versions of this graph that you might have seen online. I think I stole this one from the Nielsen Norman group, and they probably created this back in 1995 or something like that. Um, but I've actually expanded it to put some real millisecond measurements on this. So on the far left-hand side, that's 17 milliseconds, everything that's under fluid, that's really not about user interaction with your app. But that's about the way that your app moves. That's about animations being fluid, transitions kind of silky, smooth, flowing through, right? And if you do the math, that 17 milliseconds actually calculates out to be 60 frames per second. That's what that's about, getting that magical 60 frames per second. Just to the right of that, instantaneous. OK, this is when you're actually got your finger on the mobile device. You're dragging it around, and the object actually sticks to your finger. So this is really important to make sure that like, you actually feel like you're in control of the application. Beyond that, actions which are fast. These are um, maybe like navigation events, going from one particular page to the next, loading a new view. Beyond that, everything to the right, Buddy, if, if you've got something that takes that long to react, you better be throwing up a spinner or something like that to let people know that work is being done in the background. For this talk, for the next 20, 30 minutes or so, what we care about is everything on that right-hand side, that far right-hand side. What we care about, actually, for you guys, wait, that's left. That's your left, okay. <laughs> far left-hand side. From your far left-hand side, we care about fluid and instantaneous because, frankly, Everything on the right-hand side of that, there's no question that JavaScript, CSS, HTML are capable of delivering that kind of performance, right? So what is the methodology behind our science? So we took a look at a bunch of different applications. 
And we, and we kind of looked at different approaches that developers took to building out those applications. And we also took, took a look at some of the major makers of the popular UX frameworks that are out there. So I'm thinking of people here like Ionic or Onsen or Kendo, and not the MV Star frameworks, not the Angulars of the world or the Reacts of the world, but the people that are making UX controls, because those are the things that end up driving user interaction. And we said, you know what? Is there any difference between the way that average Joe developer is building things today versus the way that these people who are creating the best of breed UX frameworks are actually thinking about performance? And where there are differences between the two, what are the differences that are contributing to poor performance? Does that make sense? Yeah? And so from that, we identified six issues. By the way, the, um, all of the tests that we performed here, because you need to control for devices here, we used three kind of you know, recent but not too recent devices because we wanted to find devices that were out there being used by our mothers and our fathers and our sisters and people that are not just spending all of their time in the tech world investing in the next greatest thing, right? So they're slightly older devices. So, here are the six different areas where we found that there were discrepancies between the way that the common developer might go about building an application and the kind of the best of the Bex UX developers. So web view tax, document object model, images, animation, garbage collection, and UI controls. These are the areas where we found differences. Now, because I'm a sneaky guy, I'm only going to tell you about four of those today. Really, that's my way of um, tempting all of you to come up and talk to me afterwards so that you can find out the hidden secrets behind animation and UI controls. We'll start by talking about these four, though. Sound good? All right. So, the web view tax. Now, this first part, this is really specific to Cordova. This is the one piece of the talk that is only going to apply to hybrid applications. Now, as I said before, a uh, Cordova application has the web application running inside of a web view that's hosted inside of a native control. And because it kind of operates inside of that web view, there's a tax that you've got to pay. And so here's what we did. First, we said, you know what? Let's take a baseline. Let's measure the memory footprint of a native application and the native Java for Android, Objective-C for iOS, C-sharp for Windows, and, and Silverlight for Windows Phone, right? We said, okay, if you were just to create a hello world using the native uh, language, what would the memory footprint be? And we said, you know what? I bet that since a web view is essentially just a browser, that the memory footprint of a Cordova app would probably be the native application plus the memory footprint of the browser, and that would probably give you the memory footprint of a Cordova app, and that could kind of give us an idea of what the tax is that we pay there. So we did a measurement of a browser on each of the devices. So that's the memory footprint of about blank in a web browser on an Android phone, an iOS phone, and a Windows device. Then we measured the Cordova application. Now, there's some interesting things going on here. Clearly, Android's got something going on here. There's like a World Trade Center tower going up there that says the Cordova application has got giant memory consumption problems. On the iOS side, well, A plus B does not equal C there. Actually, the memory footprint is about the same as the browser. Windows Store, glory be, I don't even know how this is possible, but the, when, the memory footprint is lower than the native app and lower than the browser. And then Windows Phone, okay, it's kind of about the same. Now, all right, so I want you all to remember that giant tower that's there next to Android. That's going to come up later in some interesting ways, but just remember, big memory footprint on Android. So here's the thing. It's lovely to talk about memory, but we're here to talk about performance today. And memory is not something you can see. Where you can see it has an effect is on startup time. So here's what we did. Took a slow motion camera. In this case, I actually just used my iPhone 6. It has a nice little slow motion camera in it. And filmed actually starting up an application. So Hopefully you can see this. On the left-hand side, you can see us using a nice little um, touch pen to click on the Hello World app. 
on the right-hand side, you can start to see a little bit of ghosting where the application's starting to launch. We measured the number of frames in between the touch moment and the launch moment. Because it was filmed at 240 frames per second, that meant that each frame accounted for four milliseconds, and we could figure out how long it took to actually launch the application. Ah, now, remember how I asked you to remember that giant uh, kind of increase on the Android side of things? Look how tall or how long it took for those Android Cordova apps to start up. So the memory and the startup time have a strong correlation here. Um, on the iOS side, OK, this tall pillar right here, that's the native app starting up. I want to put a little caveat next to that. That's why I put a little asterisk up at the top. We actually just used the default Hello World iOS app that came out of Xcode. The way that that app is configured out of the box, it has a 500 millisecond delay. Um, that is configurable. And so I believe that that number there is actually a bit of a false representation of what the actual native implementation would, um, would kind of cause if we had adjusted that configuration setting. IOS, is, um, iOS warm is pretty good. Windows Phone cold is pretty good. And Windows Phone warm is pretty good. These cold versus warm, um, so let me kind of give you a little bit of insight into the methodology there. Cold means that we shut the phone completely down, then started it up, and then immediately started the application. Warm means that we shut the phone down, turned it back on, started the application, shut the application down, and then open the application up again. Because each of the devices makes some, um, uh, some sort of memory optimizations for the cold versus warm scenario, we wanted to make sure that we controlled for that depending upon the actual usage. So big takeaway here, memory consumption, high correlation with slower performance. We're going to see that theme repeat again and again over the course of the next 20 minutes. So takeaway, Android tends to be slower, and it tends to be slower because we think because of memory consumption. All right, there's one more place that in a Cordova application, you're actually paying a tax. And that's in that XHR request, that asynchronous call that needs to go from the web view to the native code and back again. So imagine for a moment that you are um, uh, sending a re request for geolocation data or for accelerometer data. Your web, your JavaScript, needs to make the request. It asynchronous, asynchronously crosses the web view, talks to the native code. Then the native code needs to send that response back with an x, y, and z coordinate, right? So here's what we did. We created a Cordova plugin whose only job in this big, wide world was just to receive data and to send that data back. It didn't perform any processing on the data whatsoever. It just was there to measure the impact on data size as it crossed over that WebView bridge. And what we see here is a nice linear line. Look at this. So for iOS, Android, and Windows Phone using C Sharp, as the data increases along the x-axis, the time also increases along the y-axis in a linear fashion. Note, however, crossing the very bottom of that line, there's a kind of a yellow line there, that's Windows Phone using JavaScript. Because Windows devices are able to run JavaScript as a native language, like you don't, there's no um, compilation that happens there, there's no web view to cross, and so the time to kind of interact with the plugin is zero, no matter how large the data set gets. What I want to call your attention to here, though, is that this 500K, uh, actually, this is, uh, this is more than 500K. This is 5,000K. Um, in order for you to transfer that over the web view is a period of less than, was that, 300 milliseconds or so? It's a very, very small amount of time. And so even if you were transferring a large amount of data, for example, an image taken from a camera, it's going to happen in a practically non-noticeable period of time. If you're transferring smaller bits of data, for example, accelerometer or geolocation data, it's going to be two, three, four milliseconds. Very, very tiny. So what that tells us that is that JavaScript, in terms of being able to deliver 
high performance is able to really deliver, right? You don't, there's no waiting around for it. Okay, that's it for the Cordova specific stuff. Now let's actually get into the kind of the stuff that's applicable to both Cordova and to mobile web. So I don't need to tell you guys too much about what the DOM is, you all know. Let's see a DOM, or rather an example here, and um, uh, a bit about how this is gonna work, just to make sure that we had enough time to show all the experiments. What I did is I did a screen recording of me conducting these experiments. When I actually conduct them in the lab, I'm performing these experiments thousands and thousands and thousands of times to make sure that we get a good median and a good baseline for each of them. Each one of these is exemplary of those thousands of runs. <clears throat> Okay, so in this one, I'm gonna conduct an experiment where I'm performing DOM manipulation, first using a simple DOM, and then using a complex DOM. Uh, and what I mean by that, a simple DOM has fewer elements and no nesting. The complex DOM has very deep nesting, hundreds of nodes deep, and multiple elements. For this, I'm actually running them on a Nexus 9. That Nexus 9, this is the case with all the experiments, that Nexus 9 is just being screencast to my, um, to my desktop via a fun little application called MobaZen. Um, all of the experiments I'm going to show using Android, but um, the results tend to be similar for iOS and Windows. <clears throat> okay. All right. For this, I'm just gonna bring up the Chrome DevTools. And the first one that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna trigger manipulations of the simple DOM. And you can see here, I'm just outputting to the console the amount of time required to perform each one of the manipulations. I've moved on to the complex DOM using a pen child, then complex DOM modifications using inner HTML, and then finally, complex DOM modifications using document fragment, right? So everyone pretty much knows those methods, a pen child, inner HTML. What I want to call your attention to is the amount of time that it required to perform a simple DOM manipulation versus a complex DOM manipulation. That's 0 0.026 milliseconds compared to 0 0.054 milliseconds. Now, I know, I know, I know, 0 0.026 milliseconds is just not that much time, right? It's, it's nanoseconds, right? But those will add up over time as your DOM gets more and more complex. And we're actually gonna see that happen here in just a minute. So now we know, surprise, I mean like this is almost common sense, simple DOM manipulations require less tom time than complex ones. But that can lead to some interesting choices about how you write your code. Now, I, like, this is almost unintelligent, like it's crazy that I would call this bad, right? It's list items, they've got some anchors in them, whatever. But you're gonna make some different decisions when you optimize for performance versus optimizing for code maintainability or code legibility. In this particular case, I've reduced the number of elements by 30%. And by reducing the number of elements, as that multiplies out over the broad scope of an application, that conservation of elements is going to help me tremendously. So in this case, it is functionally equivalent, but 30% fewer uh, actual DOM elements. Take away, reduce your element count. All right. So let's talk about another little uh, idiosyncrasy of DOM manipulation. And many of you may be familiar with this kind of uh, technique before. Layout thrashing is basically when you set a CSS property at the same time as on the opposite side, you're reading the CSS property. So let's see how this actually works here, right? So I got another video. And in this particular one, you'll see that on the left-hand side, I am setting my style to on the right-hand side of the equal sign, a read command. So I'm just looping through again and again and again, setting to a read. In the second case, in this one, I'm looping through, I'm reading all of the values first, and then I have a separate loop to set, right? Now, that seems like a relatively small change, and again, from a legibility or code maintainability perspective, it almost seems like the first is better. So what I'm doing here is first I am going to 
perform a, an action where, let's see, that one I am use, using the thrashing. So I'm actually the very first one I read to my set, and in the second one I do the two for loops. Now look at the t comparison here. With thrashing, that took f all, nearly four seconds. Without thrashing, it took only 56 milliseconds, right? That's a eight-fold improvement, something like that, just by changing the order by which we set and read. So real quick here, just to reinforce it, bad, don't read it and set it in the same line. Good. Read it first, set it later. Batch your layout operations, all the read at once, all the set at once. Okay, let's talk about fast list scrolling. So this is essentially when you've got thousands of elements on a page and you need to be able to scroll through them quickly in an infinite scroll. Think here of something like, um, I don't know, Facebook, right? Where you're just kind of scrolling forever and ever and ever or Twitter or whatever your favorite social media network is. So in this particular one, in the first one, I am going to use just those, I think, it's, uh, I think it actually is a thousand elements, and I'm just going to scroll through them without any kind of optimizations whatsoever. It's just DOM elements on the page iterating down. In the second case, I'm going to use virtualization. Virtualization is a technique where we essentially simplify the DOM by removing elements that are before and after the visible screen so that there are less elements on the page. And remember back before, we had our lesson about when there were fewer elements on the page, when we have a simple DOM, it's the, the, the actual browser is faster. When we have a complex DOM, the browser tends to be slower. This is that same lesson multiplied out in a way that you can actually see it in a way that the user would see it. And so here we are. We're actually launching it up. The, uh, in this particular case, I've just got a little image of some fruit. And you'll see, I'm kind of, as I scroll through here, it almost looks like the screen is disappearing. It's just going blank. That's not like a quirk of the video. That's because the elements, the, the browser itself, isn't able to keep up with the paint. And so they just disappear as I quickly, quickly, quickly move back and forth in it, right? And sometimes they disappear for seconds at a time. So in this next one, I'm actually going to launch it again. And this time, I'm going to use virtualization. So I'm only keeping in memory elements that are one or two, maybe three screens before or after the visible screen, right? Uh, in this particular case, I think what I was using here was WinJS as my virtualization engine. WinJS happens to have really good list scrolling, but there are lots of other frameworks that provide virtualization for it. All right, let's get it up here. One of the other things that I want you to notice here is one of the other tricks of virtualization is that as the, um, as the browser gets to a place where it no longer has those elements in memory, what it will start to do, you see those gray, um, gray boxes. Essentially what it's doing is putting in dummy elements so that you feel like the, the application is able to keep up with it. Think here, I'll use Facebook again as an example. of When you first load Facebook on your mobile phone, it's got a couple of placeholder um, kind of posts in there. Same idea. This is really all about improving the perception of performance. And when we measure this out, we actually measured the memory of these guys. The virtualized list, less than 100 megabytes of memory for that particular application at runtime. The non-virtualized list, over, what is that, nearly 350 megabytes. Um, and Again, we see a strong correlation between the memory consumption and the actual performance itself. And so any time that you find yourself in a position where you're trying to measure for uh, performance and trying to optimize for performance, measuring frames per second, great, you should do that. But as a proxy, it can sometimes be helpful to also look at your memory consumption as well. All right, takeaway. Use virtualization when you can. Lots of frameworks do it. My advice, don't try to do this yourself. Writing virtualization is hard. It's super hard. Just use another framework. OK, images. So here's a funny one. This is like completely, this, this blows my mind when I see this one. It's, it's totally weird. So 
I don't know. How long have CSS gradients, gradients been around? This is like, can anyone remember 2008? I don't know, something like that. CSS gradients are super, super helpful. They allow us to be a little bit more responsive in our design. It, we don't have to cut like a one by one, you know, pixel tile to kind of grade it across. But just like before, when we were looking at how we might reduce our overall element count, there are different decisions that you might make when you're optimizing for performance versus when you're maintaining for, or when you're writing for code maintainability. So in this particular case, I've got two objects. The first object just uses a regular old CSS gradient. The second object uses a PNG file to create my gradient. Right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to animate these guys and when I animate these guys, um, I'm going to use the Chrome Dev tools to measure frames per second. And um, I, I hope that many of you are familiar with the Chrome Dev tools uh, performance optimization tools. If you're not, uh, the quick rule here is that tall um, bars up there are bad. Low bars are good, right? So in the first case, where you see all those giant green skyscrapers, that's when I'm animating the CSS gradient. On the right-hand side, when I'm animating the image, all those low bars, that's when I'm animating the bitmapped ping. Like, what the, what's up with that? Like, seriously, what's up with that? So here's what I think is actually happening, right? And I, like, here I actually, you know, need to call my friends over at Google and verify this, but here's what I think is happening. When you animate that CSS gradient, Every time it moves a frame over, it needs to redraw the gradient each time. When it's animating the bitmap, or the ping in this particular case, that already exists. It doesn't need to redraw it every time, and so you get better animation when you're moving the already in-memory image compared to what's essentially creating an image for each, um, for each frame of the CSS. And so if there's a kind of a a bad version of this, again, like, can't believe I'm putting this up there, bad CSS gradients, but somehow that is the case when you're optimizing for performance versus blow your mind, good, why in the world is this? But it, once again, when you're optimizing for performance, you're going to make different decisions than you would otherwise. All right, so use images. Oh, garbage collection. Everybody loves the garbage collector. He takes all of our dirty memory away. So garbage collectors have been around for, you know, since browsers were around. And, and generally, they're pretty efficient. But when you're dealing with a mobile application, and I, I would say that this is particularly poignant for hybrid applications where the app itself is going to be a single-page application that rarely shuts down, memory management becomes really, really important. And that garbage collector, it does run automatically, but you can get yourself into a bad spot where it's, um, it's, it's unable to do its job. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to kind of show this in action. And in this particular one, hit play here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a bunch of elements, and I'm going to attach event handlers to those elements just in a loop. So you see there, add event listener. And then I'm just going to destroy them by saying enter HTML equals to blank. What that means is that as I destroy those, my event handler is still sticking around in memory. And the garbage collector has a really tough time getting back to it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start running this guy. And once again, in our friend Chrome DevTools, I want you to notice once I start running it, there's going to be a ramp, that blue ramp that starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger again. That is death. That is death for your application over time as memory just balloons out of scale. Now, granted, here I am creating thousands and thousands and thousands over again, right? Um, and you may think to yourself, well, in my web application, I'm never going to be creating these thousands of elements again and again and again. But but you actually, you are, especially if you've got a single page application. That guy could stay open for a long time. You may never shut it down for months. And as the memory grows and those event handlers stick around behind, you're basically just signing up for a browser crash at some point. So bad here. 
event listener still hanging around even after we destroyed her element. Good. Be responsible, boys and girls. Destroy your event handlers, right? Remove event, ha event listener right there. Then responsibly remove your child. All right. Now, while we're on the subject of event listeners, let's talk about how we can actually not just irresponsibly create and destroy them, but also how we can minimize the total number of them. Now, <clears throat> I don't know about you guys, but um, I often, like, I go out, I do a query selector all or a dollar sign, dollar sign. I go get a big collection of elements. I loop through them. And as I loop through them, I just add in an event handler teach one. On click, event handler. On click, event handler. And what that ends up doing is that ends up creating a rubber stamp duplicate of every function again and again and again and again. And, and that multiplicity, that, that giant collection of event handlers are once again just consuming more memory. And so what I want you to, to encourage you to do here is rather than create an event listener or event handler for each element, <clears throat> instead, think about using a single event handler for all of your objects within a node tree. Let me, let me kind of explain what I mean here a little bit. So one, two, three, four, and five, those little uh, elements down at the bottom, they've all got a common ancestor. In this case, the dude, right? So that dude, through the magic of event bubbling, receives all the same events that one, two, three, four, and five receive. So what I want to encourage you to do is think about how you can use event handlers or event listeners on the dude to respond to events that occur on its children. <clears throat> so here's what we're going to do. We're going to actually show this in action. So I'm going to have a couple of different um, uh, scenarios here. In scenario one, I'm going to have one event handler for each element. In scenario two, I'm going to use event bubbling and then attach a, uh, essentially a switch case to my event handler to say, what did you click on? Oh, you clicked on ancestor, or rather child A, then do this. And then in case three, I'm going to have that same kind of one-to-one um, um, -one relationship between event listeners and objects. But this time, I'm going to use a common function for all of them. So here's what I've done. Uh, I've just executed the first of those scenarios. That is one event handler per element. And I've taken a little um, um, snapshot of memory. Now I'm executing scenario two. This is the one with event bubbling where we use a switch case on the uh, top level element to identify the actual um, uh, element that it was clicked upon. And then, okay, we're taking that snapshot now. And now snapshot three, where we actually have um, an event listener for every element, but it all points to the same common event handler, the same common function. What I want to point to in this, and we're going to kind of drag it around here, I want you to take a look at the retained size. That's that far column right there. So look at that, 257K or 8% of the total memory is dedicated to the DOM. Okay, snapshot two, this is the one where we use the one-to-one um, uh, -one relationship. Oh man, that was 468K. And then snapshot one, this is the one, uh, oh, that's the, that's the bad one, right? That's one-to-one, -one, one event handler per object. And here we can see, I'm actually going to open it up, and you'll be able to see one event handler per object there. There it is. That um, native function right there. That's one per object. And then in snapshots one and three, those are the ones where I've got a common event handler for each element, right? Through that, I realize, uh, let's see here. I'll rewind it a bit so you can see it. There we are, the 257 there, right? It is about half of the retained memory size when I use either a common event handler for each event listener or I do the handler on the parent element. And this, this, it's helpful if you see a, um, a quick little code example here, right? So for this one, bad, I'm just doing a loop. I'm attaching a single event uh, handler to each 
object, and each of those event handlers is essentially a clone of the one before it. Whereas good, I'm attaching an event listener to the parent, and in this case, I just use an if statement. I could be a little bit more um, sophisticated and use a switch statement to figure out which child I clicked on. Again, that resulted in about half of the retained memory size, a win not only for memory, but also for your performance. So take advantage of event bubbling. Pay attention to memory leaks. Okay, memory leaks. So this is kind of a variation of what we saw earlier with the event that we left kind of hanging on, right? Where we created a lot of elements, destroyed them, and left an event handler sticking around. So in this particular one, what I'm going to do, <clears throat> excuse me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cycle through and create a bunch of elements. And then for those elements, I'm going to keep each one of the elements scoped to the private function, right? And this first time around, because it's scoped to the private function, those functions and those objects will, will, um, will be destroyed when the function itself is destroyed. And so here we're going to launch it up. There we go. Here it comes. Little heap snapshot there. All right. And so as I'm navigating from page to page, what it's essentially doing is creating those objects, destroying those objects. Creating those objects, destroying those objects, right? And as it does so, because the objects are created as part of the private function, the objects are destroyed with the lifetime of the function itself. And so here, what I want you to see, look, it's a nice clean DOM here. There are no unparented div elements. Those are all white. White is good. You like white. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch it up a little bit. This time, just by removing the var declaration from within the function scope, I'm immediately putting each one of the div elements into the global scope. Because they are in the global scope, they are not destroyed when you destroy the function as well. And so, those will end up hanging around as unparented DOM fragments sticking around in my application. So here we go. We're going to do the navigation again. I'm going to fast forward just a little bit. There we go. Navigate back and forth once again, creating, destroying each of the functions. But this time, because all of my elements are being created in the global scope, when I create and destroy my functions, my objects are still sticking around. My DOM objects are still sticking around. All right. Let the snapshot do its computational powers. And when we expose this, look at all of that red. Each one of those objects that's marked as kind of with a pinkish red background, these are objects that are just polluting your DOM, taking up space, taking up memory, and dragging you down, right? So a good kind of check for yourself is run your application for a little while. Go back into Chrome DevTools, see if you can find any of these objects that are red, and try and find out where those get created, how you can destroy them, because over time, they're just going to increase your overall memory footprint and ultimately drag down your performance as well. So bad. In this particular case, we've got the element created in the global scope outside of the function. Good, we're actually creating the element within the scope of the function. And so it gets destroyed with the function. Destroy all your unused objects. So, we're getting to the end of it. I beg, beg of you, if you remember anything about this talk, anyone can build slow apps. You can, you can. That guy has, I know he has. Back there, you can do it too. Anyone can build slow apps, but you don't have to. Like, go into it thinking about performance first before it drags you down in the end. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, Ryan J. Salva, come talk to me afterwards. I'd love to talk to you about animation and UI controls and all the experiments that I didn't get to share with you today.
Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, totally. Thank you. Thanks.